Yes. Yeah, I really miss uh, being able to sit down with everyone and have a glass of wine last night and talk. And I uh, love what you just said about thinking of spine as its own specialty. Uh, I love the idea of it doesn't matter if you're a, comes from the orthopedic or neurosurgical residency, we're all spine surgeons now. So this talk is directed at fellows and residents, not so much specific areas of knowledge, but really how to approach new technology. So back when I was a fellow, they were just coming off of this thing where they looked at non-surgical treatment for scoliosis. And it kind of made sense if you built up the muscles on the convex side and made them stronger, the spine would straighten. And this made so much sense that if people were suggesting you would operate on scoliosis, that was like a till of the hun. Of course, you'd want to do this non-operatively. So they electrocuted these kids for eight hours a night to build up the muscles on one side. And there was amazing success. It was 97% successful if the patients were compliant. This is a constant theme. Whenever things don't work out so well, a lot of patient blaming goes on. Like, oh, well, the patients weren't compliant. Now, eventually, this was, became the bandwagon. And the bandwagon effect is what happens when something becomes popular quickly as people follow the example set by others. And everyone likes to jump on the bandwagon, especially the marketing department. It brings in patients and it makes you famous. Jumping on the bandwagon is great. And pretty soon, there were 54 investigators using this non-invasive stimulation method for fixing idiopathic scoliosis. Now the success rate only went down to 72%. It's probably because those patients weren't being compliant. Now when people jump off the bandwagon, it tends to be a little bit more lonely affair. They don't publish this in the internet. They don't have the marketing department getting them in the six o'clock news to say they're jumping off the bandwagon. Many people just quietly do that and never even publish a paper as to why they don't do this great technique anymore. It wasn't until 14 years later that the SRS uh, non-operative committee did a study showing that electrocuting kids all night doesn't fix scoliosis. Why did this take 14 years to get here? Why did the success rate go from 97% to 72% to zero? What's wrong with us as surgeons and as scientists to allow this to happen? Well, this is something we are all subject to, confirmation bias. The tendency to process information in a way that confirms your pre-existing belief and giving less consideration to alternative possibilities. I am subject to this constantly. That's why I have a children and wife to keep me in line. And I ask all my young researchers, like, you know, call me out on this. If I believe something that there's not data for, this is going to be a great paper. Let's question each other. Now, anytime a new treatment comes, the results look great at first. And as the results look great, these are the people that are the grand round speakers. And you see this at the academy and at different courses. Things are fantastic. But over time, complications start to occur and start to be reported. Now, one thing you could do is just always do whatever is new, and then you never have complications. You jump from one new thing to the next. And I would caution you to beware of charismatic thought leaders who are only reporting good results. They are out there. I want to ask sometimes like, well, wait up, five minutes ago, you said to do this. Why are you doing something different? What went wrong with the other one? Look for people who honestly present their complications. Those are the people you want to follow and you want to learn from. There was a thoroscopic instrumentation bandwagon. People approached me and said, if you're not doing thoroscopic instrumentation for scoliosis, no one will ever do your fellowship. And now I'm lucky I have spine fellows and peds ortho fellows and neurosurgical residents and orthopedic residents all working together. And nobody's doing this anymore. And what's funny is nobody reports on why they're not doing this anymore. Now, spine surgery should be the last option. Um, you know, if you could put a suction cup in a spine and fix it, yeah, we should do that. But we have to look and figure out which one of these actually work. Um, so here is the latest, greatest craze. Shroth therapy has only been around for about 100 years or so. 
And if it really did work this well, where you can cure a five-year-old boy of polio scoliosis in eight weeks, you know, it should win the Nobel Prize in medicine. Um, but it doesn't seem to work that well. Most of the studies um, that are in favor of Schroth therapy tend to be in journals that I haven't heard of. And the effect size seems to be around three degrees or six degrees. Um, but this definitely is a bandwagon. There's a lot of people that seem to believe in this almost like a religion. Now the Cochrane collaboration said that there was not enough evidence to recommend any type of exercise for scoliosis. And Dr. Tolo and Dr. Herring recently came out and said there's and said there's still no studies that provide valid evidence that exercise helps scoliosis, but people are flocking to this. So this is a patient who really educated me as to what might be going on. This is the same day, the same patient. Um, when the patient stood in the position the therapist told her to, the lower curve was 29. When they stood in the normal position, it was 49 degrees. We said, maybe something's going on here. And it turns out, as we asked more and more patients to stand both in the trough position and the normal position, there was an average difference of six degrees and a leg length discrepancy of eight millimeters. So I guess the patients were flexing one knee a little bit and trying to hold the spine straight. So it's possible that all these positive results are just a result of standing in a position that you're trained to for the x-ray. Are you going to hold that position the rest of your life? Probably not. And the unpublished study now out of uh, Texas Scottish Rite, uh, again, confirms that therapy probably isn't having a large effect on scoliosis. But we're right in the middle of a time when people want to do this. They want to spend money on it and put time into it. And the idea could be, well, it can't hurt, could it? But it's a missed opportunity cost. Right now, our teenagers have a lack of sleep. They are so busy you know, trying to get into college on their grades and sports and everything else. So anytime you're putting something else onto someone's plate in terms of time and money, there could be missed opportunity costs. And we should remember that <clears throat> when people say, well, it can't hurt, like, yeah, if you're withholding real treatment or proven treatment, as a disease process progresses, like the scoliosis gets worse, the patient may be facing a bigger, more dangerous surgery because treatment has been withheld. So uh, let's look at another thing. This is a JBJS study <clears throat> reporting on the effect of RISR stage on bracing outcome for scoliosis. Now the results said there was no association between the hours of brace wear and progression of surgery to RISR zero. So what should the conclusions be? That you have to wear the brace more? That doesn't make sense. So if the authors deeply believe that bracing works, they then believed that, well, we didn't find any difference because the patients didn't wear the brace enough. Another example of confirmational bias. And let me see if I can turn this volume off quickly. So magnetically controlled growing rods. You can just straighten the patient out without operatively lengthening the rods. This looks like a miracle. It looks absolutely wonderful. And when the first big paper came out, authored by two SRS past presidents, here's the data at the top. At six months and 12 months and at 24 months, the length of the spine is pretty much identical. But the conclusion was the study showed satisfactory growth. It didn't. Confirmatory bias. How do papers like this get into spine and JBJS? And then there is the idea of putting in staples. Staples was the big craze for idiopathic scoliosis. And all of a sudden, nobody ever used them anymore. And fortunately, one group of people published papers saying that one third of these completely failed. There were horrible results with this and it stopped being used. And when people originally promoted this idea, it was minimally invasive. And next thing you know, they're doing more minimally invasive surgery in the back. And somebody's fused down to the pelvis. It was questionable if they ever needed any surgery at all. So be very cognizant that every time we make any type of medical intervention, we probably are subjecting patients to complications. So what about tethering? That's the latest, greatest. So here's an example of a mature patient, 39 degree curve. 
would not get surgery in my practice, most people's practices, but because it was minimally invasive, maybe parents went for it. Um, and are we at the stage of tethering where we're just seeing the good results now? Who knows? So here's a paper that won the best paper at IMAST this year, and it found out that when you compared tethering to a posterior spinal fusion, every single time there was a difference, the tether did worse. The tether had less correction, many more revisions. And what was kind of surprising is the kids who had tether surgery had a worse self-image. Maybe it's because they still had significant deformity. And we're probably all sick of seeing this if you sit on an airplane and read the magazine, how lasers and spine surgery will fix everything. You know, a pretty good team of people looked at this and said, lasers don't do anything good and they can do harm. So why is it that we still see all this advertising for laser spine surgery? Um, and how do patients know that things like this are full of poop? How do we educate the patients? The patients are wanting this. So one of the things that's been interesting is if authors have a conflict of interest, if they have consulting fees, research funding, or stock ownership, the results of what they report are much, much better. So when we look at a new technology, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that maybe it's not just the technology, but maybe the opportunity for marketing and building a practice. Here's an example of a 16 year old mature patient who I said didn't need surgery, but they told me they were very fortunate. They found someone who would do this minimally invasively. See those two screws at the top? Mm. Turns out that these two screws at the top pinch the poor kid's spinal cord she was not able to attend college. She was studying lying in bed through a series of mirrors to read her textbooks because anytime her head went up and down, the spinal cord was pinched by these screws and there was searing pain running down her neck. So here's the most influential medical journal in the United States, US News. And I'm not kidding. I think it is the most influential watching what hospitals do to increase the ranking. There was a question and if you provided pre-op nutritional consults, you got more points because we know that that helps neuromuscular scoliosis. Only problem is it doesn't. We did a study of 243 patients and found out that those who had a pre-op nutrition consult did know better. All it did was delay surgery and spend lots of money. So even things that we think make sense, maybe don't make sense. And that's why we do studies and try to do them with an open mind. This may be the last one. So if people want to look at disc degeneration, one way of doing that is just taking a little needle and poking it into the disc. That causes disc degeneration. What's interesting, some people are promoting a new anterior scoliosis correction where you cut all the way through the disc and put on some tethers. I could only find one patient reported in the literature, but there's actually hundreds of people having this surgery. And what's interesting is surgery like this isn't really covered by insurance companies. So I had my nurse call up and it's between 60 and $100,000 cash. So I'm aware of churches and groups that are raising money for people to have this miracle surgery. And what about the patients that wanna do a urine test so they could determine your child's scoliosis nutritional needs? Now we can laugh at this, we can make fun of that, but if we do, then we risk alienating the family. So we have a fine balance between protecting our patients from harm and not alienating them. So in conclusion, I'd say beware of jumping on the bandwagon, beware of confirmational bias in ourselves and other reports, and beware of recommendations of thought leaders who only report positive results. And before I jump on the bandwagon, I think in my stomach, because your stomach thinks the best, what would you really want for your family? And the final one is intraop navigation. Now, how could that go wrong? Just seeing better is good. The first time this system was used in a hospital, the patient died um, in, in Southern California because a relatively straightforward T2 to pelvis in a neuromuscular patient all of a sudden took eight hours. The patient literally bled to death. So as one introduces new technology, it frequently slows down surgery and introduces a whole new level of complications. So thank you. This is a, 
a picture of my new operating rooms. We have about seven spine rooms going at a time. The entire floor is just spine and neurosurgery. I would welcome questions. Thank you. And as always, thought provoking. Um, so there's some chat room uh, questions. I have to try to get into them. But uh, I have one question uh, that goes into the ethical uh, dimension, and that is a decision making for an adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, who do we actually treat? Is it the minor patient, usually 15, 16 year old, uh, prevalently female, or do we treat the parents? And how do you, as an experienced clinician, differentiate the interests and needs of those two entities? Yes, that's a great question. And the truth is we are treating the patient. And to every patient, I say, I work for you. This is your body, unless there's really cool stuff coming up with AI, you're probably gonna keep your body for the rest of your life and nothing will be done to you without your understanding and your consent. Um, and I have had one patient who I thought needed surgery decide not to do it. Um, but otherwise, the kids could oftentimes, I'd say, understand and accept maybe even better than the parents can, as long as you're talking to the patient and explaining the risks and complications and alternative treatments to the patient. Yes, our loyalty must be to the patient and not to do what the parents tell you to. And if you lose some patients for that reason, so be it. Second question, since we have uh, bright young minds in this full auditorium, it's so nice to see it again in this post-COVID recovery or uh, uh, cyclical uh, uh, upturn, uh, hopefully not sustained, hopefully. Um, complex scoliosis cases, uh, who does them and how do you integrate education and a young trainee enter doing very complex instrumentation in a highly distorted patient? But to be honest, I have PGY2s in my operating room on a regular basis, and I expect them to start putting in the pedicle screws on their side. But before doing that, we are one on one in my office with a spine model and a drill bit and a reamer. And we spend, you know, 30 minutes together putting in screws together. And then when I'm convinced that they're doing a good job in a model, then they will do that in the operating room. Um, so I think that as long as the surgeon puts the time into teaching and evaluating the trainee, the trainees definitely have a place at the table. 